Welcome back, y'all. We're jumping back into fishing our tree today. Um, we have a couple more days left of this book. I don't remember. Um, but make sure we're finishing strong. Um, we have three chapters, three questions today, like we have been. Um, make sure you're getting those two sentences per question. Um, and we'll just make sure we're finishing strong, okay? I'm just going to hop into it today. Because uh, I don't have any announcements. So, here we go. Chapter 34, Birth of a Star. Keisha, Albert, and I walked to Albert's after school. Keisha and I asked if we could come over and see his house. And he shrugged and said, okay. The whole time my hand is in my pocket, holding on to that piece of paper. Possible. Albert's house is big, but dark and dusty when we enter. There's piles of things everywhere. Not papers like our house. I mean piles of things with tubes and wires. Things I don't recognize. His mom greets us. Hey, Albert, you have guests? Her tone tells us that this never happens. Yes, I do. These are my friends Keisha Almond and Allie Nickerson. Allie and Keisha, this is my mother, Audrey Dubois. He says, waving at each of us, and he comes over and shakes our hands. Can I get you anything to eat, she asks, sounding nervous. Albert pauses. No, thank you. We'll just go upstairs. His mom says okay as we are already following him up a skinny, twisty staircase. What kind of host, Keisha begins, doesn't allow his guests to have some food? Dang it, Albert. I wouldn't have minded some. It wouldn't be logical to offer you something that doesn't exist. But she offered it to us, Keisha says. He opens his backpack up and begins stacking his books on his desk like a pyramid. I can assure you that the refrigerator is quite empty. In fact, it hasn't been plugged in for a week. Oh, Keisha says, her voice getting quiet. I'm sorry, Albert. I really am. Now I know why his mom's voice sounded funny when she offered us, when she offered, and why he eats so much at school. Yeah, me too, I add. He turned surprised. Why? Keisha scrunches up her face to that look she gets when she can't really figure him out. Well, I say, because you don't have food. Or a refrigerator. Must be terrible to be hungry and not be able to eat. And it's probably embarrassing for you. Maybe. I mean, I think it would be, I guess. He tilts his head. Filling the refrigerator doesn't fall within the parameters of my responsibilities. Therefore, the lack of food with therein would be have... Sorry, Albert's too smart for me sometimes, guys. I gotta reread this line. Filling the refrigerator does not fall within the parameters of my responsibilities. Therefore, the lack of food therein would have no reflection upon me whatsoever. We are silenced. I don't know about Keisha, but I couldn't answer for that. But I couldn't answer that for a million years. From the looks of her, I don't think she can either. I finally lift my gaze from his face and look around his room. Just a bed, a desk, and an empty trash can. The carpet and his blankets are all dark green, but his walls have colorful posters, all science related. There's one I like the most. Picture of outer space, with every color you can think of, all swirled together with a giant orange glow off to the side. It's beautiful. I point at it. Albert, what is that? That is the birth of a star, the single most important thing that can happen in space. Well, the single most positive thing, anyway. It's beautiful, I say. He stares at it. Indeed it is, he says, sitting down at his desk. Keisha laughs. You're going to be a star one day, Albert. You'll do something amazing. I don't like... He shifts his seat. I don't wish to be in the limelight. Limelight, I ask? I don't like a lot of attention. Well, you better get used to it, Albert, Keisha says, because there's no way on God's green earth that you won't have boatloads of it when you go out and cure cancer or discover another planet or something. That's my hope. I want to change the world, do something good. And then all of a sudden, I feel sad as Keisha goes about how famous Albert will be, how he'll be written about in history books and stuff. Hey, Keisha says, poking me. Why so serious over there? I'm thinking about the things Albert and Keisha will do and how I can't even read. I can't tell them that, though, so I try to sound happier. I'm not that serious. Oh, yes, you are. Dead serious. You need to smile. I am smiling, I say. Well, someone better tell your face about it. I hesitate. Can I tell you both a secret, I ask, reaching in my pocket to touch my possible paper that I've carried since I've got it? Yeah, of course. And you won't tell anyone? Yes. 
Now, what's the secret? We won't tell anyone, because that's the definition of what a secret is. Albert is quiet, but he tilts his head to the side. I, I've never really told anyone this, but I, I have a lot of trouble in school with reading and writing and everything. But math and art, Keisha laughs. That is not a secret. And then I feel terrible, and I feel my eyes beginning to sting. I start walking away, but she pulls my sleeve and pulls me back. Albert looks upset. No, that's not what I mean. I mean that we know that, but it doesn't matter to us. However, Albert says, I do wish it was easier for you. We shall not share your secret. Mr. Daniel says I have something called dyslexia, which makes it hard to read letters. That's why I've been staying after school, so he can help me. Keisha's wide-eyed. Extra school after school? That's terrible. I mean terrible. I want to tell her I spent the night at school hanging upside down in the closet if I could just read. I don't mind he's nice to... I don't mind. He's nice to help me. And we'll help you, Albert says. But I worry that maybe he can't help me, I say. And then I mumble it. It makes me feel like I'll grow up to be a nobody. How can you say that? Keisha asks. Well, you'll probably have some big successful baking company and Albert will do whatever in the world Albert will do. And I'm just hoping to read a menu in a restaurant. Keisha steps up and puts her arm around my shoulder. You say he's going to help you, right? You say, Albert adds, and then pauses to think that you'll grow up to be nobody. But logically, if nobody's perfect, well, you must be perfect. Perfect? Me? Uh, no, I say. You are perfect, Ali, Keisha says, laughing. Do like Mr. Daniel says. Be yourself. Be who you are. You know, Albert says, I've wondered about that saying, and I can't ever find an answer anywhere on the internet. What do you mean, I ask? Be yourself. You always hear that. So? Keisha asks. Well, Albert begins, what if you don't know who you are? I get what he means, I think. People ask us what we want to be when we grow up. I know what kind of grown-up I want to be, but I don't know who I am now. Albert stretches his legs out. There are always people ready to tell you who you are, like a nerd or a jerk or a wimp. I think how hard it's not it I think how it's hard to not believe the bad stuff. Look at it this way, Albert says. If you had to be in a tank of water with a killer whale or a stonefish, which would you choose? Well, duh. Who's going to choose a killer whale? Well, in the wild, killer whales never attack people. Like, never. A stonefish is way more dangerous with its 13 venomous spikes. It's the world's... If the killer... It's the words. If the killer whale were called a friendly whale, no one would be scared. And I think of the words. The power they have. How they can be waved around like a wand. Sometimes for good, like Mr. Daniels uses them. How he makes me mad, or how he makes kids like me and Oliver feel better about ourselves, and how words can also be used for bad, to hurt. My grandpa used to say to be careful with eggs and words, because neither can ever be fixed. The older I get, the more I realize how smart my grandpa was. Chapter 35, A Picture is Worth a Gazillion Words. Oh, sorry, y'all. We have a sub. This is bad news. Then it gets even worse. We begin with an assignment to write about a person that we know who is brave. I start to come up with reasons to get out of the assignment. Go to the nurse. I haven't yet met a sub who says no to a trip to the nurse when you tell them you're going to throw up on their shoes. I put on my sick look. Just as I'm about to raise my hand, the sub turns to class. Where is Allie Nickerson? Huh? Freaky. I raise my hand. Oh, I have a note that says you don't have to write, so you can just draw a picture of your person. My face gets hot. Well, that figure, Shay says. She can practice her coloring, and then there will be Play-Doh and nap time. My toe curls up in my sneakers, and I slide down into my chair. The, shub, the sub looks at Shay and shakes her head, but kids are already laughing. So what's the difference? The sub gives everyone else a piece of lined paper, and she gives me a plain one. I sit, stunned, wondering why Mr. Daniels would do this to betray me. Now I feel like I really am going to throw up. I stand and have to concentrate on walking to move toward the door. Where are you going, the sub asks. Out. You come back here and do your picture. Now. I mean it. I'm finished. What are you talking about? It's blank. No, it's not blank. I drew a ghost in a blizzard. And then the door slams behind me. I hear kids laughing at my answer. Soon I am keeping Miss Silver's chair warm. 
So, Miss Nickerson, I must admit that I've enjoyed not seeing you lately. Things seem to be better with Mr. Daniels as your teacher. He's keeping you in line. Yeah, he's a peach, I say. With a cut in my voice, are you going to call my mom? No, I don't think so. I want you to call her. Please. Please call her. Why? Please, I ask. I don't even know why I'm asking exactly. She looks surprised, but it's silent. She dials the phone and talks for a bit. Tell her that I've had a tough day. Then she hands me the phone. She would like to speak with you. I take the phone from her. Allie, what in the world is going on? I try not to cry. I really do. But the tears leak from my eyes. Everything is so tight inside and I'm tired of it being this way. It's not like I wake up every day planning to be a failure. And I thought I had finally found someone to help me. And then Mr. Daniels pulls this. Allie, did you hear me? Mom is all I can get out. But it's squeaky and filled with longing to pour through the phone wires to sit with me. I hear it in her voice. She feels as upset as I do. Put Miss Silver back on the phone. Miss Silver listens for a little bit and says, Oh, okay, Miss Nickerson, we'll be in touch then. I head to the bathroom and sit in the stall long enough for the evidence of crying to go away. When I get back to class, I ask Keisha to help me write a note, so I'm sure it's all correct. I leave it on Mr. Daniel's desk. I'm never reading after school or playing class playing chess with you ever again. Not ever. That afternoon, I drop onto my usual spot at Peterson's. I wonder what mom will say about the call from school. When she comes over, she kisses the top of my head, which says it all. So a ghost and a blizzard, huh? She smiles at me. I half smile. Yeah. Pretty funny, I think. She leans over and puts her hand on my cheek, and it's everything I can do to not cry right there in front of everyone. I trusted him, I tell her. He's the first teacher who, and I stop because I can't say the words. You know, honey, I bet there's an explanation for this. I bet Mr. Daniels didn't mean for this to happen. Give him a chance, okay? I nod. I hope she's right because I want to think that Mr. Daniels doing something mean to anyone is like a fish swimming upside down and backwards. Chapter 36. The Game of Life. First thing, Mr. Daniels calls me into the hallway. So I heard you got in a bit of trouble yesterday. I fold my arms. Teachers often leave special instructions for a sub, but she was not supposed to share my notes with the class. I figured I'd write her a note telling her you could draw a picture so she didn't pressure you to write. I know that you struggle and I thought I was helping you, but I see I shouldn't have handled it by singling you out that way. Allie, I think you know I never would hurt you on purpose. I do know that, and I'm so relieved to hear him say that. So, I'm sorry, Allie. I really am. I hope you can forgive me. He holds out his hand to shake, and I shake back. That afternoon, Mr. Daniels moves his king, placing it on black square between his own bishop and my knight, and I see the three of us, Albert, Keisha, and me. With Keisha as bishop, tall and powerful, and able to move across the entire board in one move, with Albert being king, the piece with a ton of of value, but the only one unable to move more than one space at a time, always taking tiny steps, always running and hiding from hiding behind the others. And then there's the knight, the piece that Mr. Daniel says is the clever one, the best piece for catching opponents in a fork, a piece that only moves in an L. I feel like I'm the knight, as I've spent my whole life jumping over things. Shay is the queen, the piece with the most power to the move and frighten. The piece most protected and sacrificed for. I realize that dealing with Shay every day is like playing chess. She's always looking for your weakness, always trying to get you flustered and force you into a mistake. Against her, you have to remember that the board is always changing and moving. Keep your eyes open and be careful. Have a plan. Realize you can only stay on the defensive for so long. Eventually, you have to take a stand, but no matter what, don't give up. Because every once in a while, a pod becomes a queen. Well, Mr. Daniels asks, pulling me from my mind movie, you've been thinking a long time over there. Thinking about your move? I look back. I search. I haven't beaten him lately, and I so want to. And then I see it. It's the night. The answer is the night. I pick it up and move it. And hold my finger on top to be sure I haven't made a mistake. Yep, I've put his king in check and given him nowhere to move. Checkmate. 
He throws up his hand, but seems happy. You didn't let me win, right? Allie, I have three brothers. I'm not capable of letting someone win. He laughs a little. I think you're just invincible. And then he winks and begins taking the pieces off the board and putting them in the box. I'm sad the game is over, and I'm relieved that I trust him again. And isn't it funny that I've gone from invisible to invincible? And that's where we're going to end today. See you all tomorrow.